Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us for our, our Lunch with the Friends series of live video presentations. I'm Chris Knopp, Executive Director of Friends of the Boundary Waters Wilderness. And before we begin, I want to uh, um, recognize and acknowledge the, the, the twin challenges our communities are all facing following the, the murder of George Floyd. Uh, amidst the, the pandemic, uh, the COVID-19 pandemic that we are in here. I want you to know that uh, Friends of the Boundary Waters Wilderness is committed to being a, a good nonprofit citizen and helping make our community stronger. For over 40 years, Friends of the Boundary Waters Wilderness has been the leader in protecting the Boundary Waters. And we've been that leader because of you. Uh, at the end of the day, we are a people organization and the strength of our organization is based on our supporters. Today, our programs focus on three areas, wilderness, people, and community. For the wilderness, there are two mines and one threat. The two mines are twin metals and polymet, and the threat is the, uh, is the clean water of the boundary waters. Through lawsuits, legislation, and community action, we are uh, fighting to protect the clean water of the boundary waters, and I want to thank all of you that are part of that, that fight with us. Second, for people. We believe that there are no boundaries to the boundary waters, and we are committed to uh, creating equity in the boundary waters through classroom education, online programs, and scholarships for wilderness canoe trips. Uh, we uh, try to achieve uh, 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 equity in the boundary waters and ensuring that there are no boundaries to enjoying the boundary waters. And we invite you for your suggestions on, on how we can uh, do that job better. And that will be a topic of, of future uh, uh, webinar discussions uh, for us. And finally, for community, we understand that the, uh, that the boundary waters and the communities that are gateways to the boundary waters, Ely, Grand Marais, and the others have a shared fate. And we want those communities to be stronger in order to protect the boundary waters. And we are advertising for a boundary waters community coordinator to be based in Ely. And uh, we invite that uh, for you, those of you that are out there that are interested in that position to please apply and please uh, send that uh, job description around to others that might be interested in that. We are so, so fortunate this afternoon to have Dan Pauly back with us to uh, talk about tips and tricks for planning a great Boundary Waters canoe trip. And uh, my co-host is our communication director, Pete Marshall. Uh, Dan has the good fortune of, of uh, going up to the Boundary Waters uh, uh, tomorrow uh, and uh, catch a, a few fish with, with uh, Rob Christ, who was another uh, presenter here. Uh, Dan is something of a renaissance man when he's not practicing law or, uh, or uh, keeping bees or, rowdy, or writing books about Boundary Waters route planning. Um, he is in the Boundary Waters. and. Uh, we are going to benefit from, uh, from practical tips, whether you're a beginner or a, a seasoned paddler, uh, from Dan's suggestions. So without further ado, Dan, please, uh, please take this away. Good. Thank you, Chris. Um, so what I'm going to do today is kind of go over uh, the things you might want to know or would, would help, a, help you have a trip after, you know, after you've got your permit and after you've got your route planned. Uh, I remind you the Friends of the Boundary Waters now has some good route planning information right on the website. Uh, there are various books you can do use to get that information. I wrote one as well. Um, so let's assume you've got your permit. Let's assume that you've got your route planned. Uh, and then let's think, what are you doing next? What are you going to bring along? Maybe how are you going to travel? How are you going to set up your canoe? A few things like that. So, you know, in about a half an hour, we can't really cover everything. Uh, but we can cover a lot of stuff that I think people will find interesting. Some of it's relatively basic. A lot of people who are on the, uh, on the call today probably have already heard of, but I'm going to have a few things that maybe you haven't. So these are the things that I do. Um, you know, that doesn't mean it's the only way things can be done. And I'm sure other folks have good ways that are different than what I do. So the first thing uh, I always tell people going up and whatever, what, the first thing I always say, like, just don't forget, you have to bring it along by law, but you have to have your personal flotation device, right? Um, I know that's required, but it's not enough, in my opinion, to just have it in your canoe. You got to wear it. Okay. So this is your classic design that, you know, kind of came out of kayaking, but good shoulder movement. So this is one that I have. This is actually more of a youth one, but these are great. Another one you can have would be, uh, this is one I bought sort of accidentally. We were missing one on our way up as we bought one. This one I got, this was one with all those little pat, uh, little uh, pockets and stuff. And, and these are great too. So this is one I actually usually wear. It kind of looks old fashioned, but I can put like matches and other things in here. So 
either one of those is great. And there are other designs like inflatable ones that only go off when you uh, go in the water, but yeah, you have to wear it. If you look at the DNR data um, on fatalities uh, associated with boating and water, there's no question wearing the life jacket, personal flotation dynamics makes a huge difference. So you, you, you don't, don't just have it in your canoe, have it on, okay? No matter how short your canoeing, if you're going fishing for five minutes, still put it on. Okay, number one, that's something you need to have. Uh, now, the other thing, obviously, with the boundary waters is you're usually going to have a canoe. Sometimes a kayak, but most people are going to canoe. And so uh, I don't have, you know, we're in my basin right now. I don't have my canoe here, but I wanted to point out a few things about the canoes uh, that you could have. This is a little model that I received uh, as a wedding present. This would be a wood, uh, wood and canvas model. But uh, most people are going to bring along, you're going to decide, like, maybe you can borrow a canoe, you can rent a canoe, maybe you own a canoe. Uh, the, the, the type of canoe that I would recommend taking up, especially if you have any portages, is going to be a Kevlar or carbon fiber canoe. So a couple of Minnesota companies, uh, Winona manufactures those, North Star makes those. There's non-Minnesota companies like Source River make those. They're, they're all great canoes. Um, and that's going to weigh about 40 pounds. You can also use aluminum or some other materials that uh, have been made over time um, that weigh more. Uh, and those work, but they're just going to be a lot more, di lot more difficult to get across the portage. Now, when you have your canoe, and I think anybody who's been up there before would know, it's essential that you have, if you're going to portage, no, no, a, a yoke on here. There's not a yoke here shown, but you're going to have a, a fort across with a little couple pads so that you can carry it on your shoulders. Um, and if you've never been there before, you might not know that. And if you're just borrowing your uncle's canoe, he might not have one on there. And so you have to put that yoke on there and you can rent them usually at Outfitters. They're not that expensive to buy. But uh, over the years, I've seen a lot of people, maybe probably on their first trip, trying to carry the canoe just with two folks. And it's, it's really difficult to navigate. It's an awkward weight that way. You're gonna wanna have a, you're gonna have a yoke on there, okay? And I think um, if you've not been up there before, that's, that's a tip that really you, you would definitely want, okay? Now, I also like having, as I said, the Kevlar or carbon fiber because it's a lot lighter weight. Um, the other thing you're going to have, and again, you can, you can rent all kinds of canoes up, in, uh, up at the edge of the boundary waters, uh, uh, the various outfitters, or obviously bring your own. Um, the other sort of essential piece of gear is going to be paddles, all right? And there's a lot of types of paddles. This is sort of, uh, this is the one I use. I'll hold it back here. So this is a bending branches paddle. And I have had this one for like 25 years. So I would, I would bet there's not too many paddles that have been more lakes than this one has been in the boundary waters. But um, this is a wooden paddle uh, that has a bent shaft in it. So you can see the handle and then the shaft, the shaft is bent so the, the blade is at an angle. And the reason for that is when you're in the water with your stroke, you kind of see it here, but you want the, the blade will be perpendicular to your mode of your, your direction of travel when you've got your main power stroke. So this kind of paddle originally came out of uh, canoe racing, but now a lot of recreational use it with a bent shaft in it. So that's, that's kind of, uh, th th those would be a preferred paddle for most folks. Um, and this is wood and it's held up for many years and it's got a rock guard on it, but that came with it. But um, you can also get some really nice um, carbon fiber ones that are, uh, that are going to last a long time if you treat them well. Uh, and one note is most outfitters uh, up near the Boundary Waters, they sell off their gear after one or two, maybe three seasons. So you can find in the fall, you can find canoes actually, and you can find paddles for significantly below retail and they're lightly used maybe for a season or two, it varies. And you know, you're going to put some scratches on both those things anyway. So why not buy it used if you're going to buy it? Just a thought. The other thing you're going to have, this is a different type of paddle, but I usually bring it along. Uh, you need a spare paddle. Like, you know, if you've got uh, however many people you have, probably one spare paddle is necessary because they do break sometimes or they could get lost. Um, and so this is your more classic uh, plastic and aluminum paddle. This is pretty indestructible, but I, I always have one extra paddle along. You don't want to run out of paddles. Okay. So you've got your canoe and you've got your paddles. Um, you got your life jacket. Uh, there'll be a few other things in your canoe that we'll think about, but the most significant thing is going to be packs. And so you're going to be carrying your stuff. Um, and we're going to talk about what I bring in my pack, but let me talk first about what kind of pack I'm going to bring. Okay. And so I've had them all over the years. I'll show you some of the options. Uh, I'll show you the disadvantages and the advantages of each one. And I'll tell you what I bring. Okay. So this is your classic. All right. This is actually, uh, you know, your, 
your canvas canoe pack. The pretty, it's pretty square. Even full, it's going to be relatively flat. You know, puffs out, but it's square. Um, this one's made by Duluth Pack, um, who I think originated this design. But Frost River is a Minnesota company as well. They make so both those companies make very good gear. Um, but it's canvas. Uh, it looks great. You can hang on your wall, you know, in your den or your library or your basement. And these are great, right? Um, and uh, very common. One of the nice things about this kind of pack, it's going to sit low in your canoe, and it's going to be squared off so that you know it'll like fill up a little square here and say a little square here you can sit on it it's going to be stable those are those are your classics now because it's canvas uh it's going to all water's going to come in and out of that and you're always going to have some water at the bottom of your canoe generally so you're going to align your pack with a plastic bag generally and it could be just you know a bag you bought it like say home depot or you know a local store but uh outfitters will sell heavy duty bags but even if you have one of those heavy duty bags that they can still leak. So the things that you want to know or you want to bring is like anything that you cannot get wet, which is probably most important, your sleeping bag, but some clothes too. What I do is I pack, I have a couple of different manufacturers of these, but this is a compression sack that's a waterproof. Okay. And so you put your gear in there, like your sleeping bag or your clothes, you snap it down and it compresses to a small size. But it's waterproof. Now, not that you'd hold on to water for like days, but it can definitely get pretty wet and your stuff will be dry. So if I'm bringing a Frost River pack or if I'm bringing a Duluth pack, I'm going to have a plastic bag with whatever clothes and stuff I have in there um, in something like this. Now, things that can get wet, I'll show you a few of those things. Like if you have pots and pans, which probably wouldn't be with your clothes, that's okay. They don't have to be in any sort of bag. But clothes, you'd want to have double bagged. Okay. Now, on alternative... Uh, to that traditional design, which you'll see a lot of those outfitters rent them out. They come in all sorts of sizes. You can rent them, you can buy them. Um, there's the sort of modern take on that. And this one's made by Granite Gear. Um, and I got this as a gift. And these are nice. It's very similar, maybe, uh, but it's a, it's a synthetic. Otherwise, they're pretty similar. It's going to have buckles instead of, you know, um, the, it's going to have a more clicking buckle. But these are, these are great. Just a different way of doing it. And then... Um, Another design is these waterproof backpacks. They, they're, most of them are made by Sea Line, Sea Line. And uh, you can see it's kind of like that little stuff sack I had, but this thing will roll up. Uh, you put your gear in it. This is holding it sideways. It's got a couple little straps on it. You put your gear in, you fold over the top, roll it down, letting some of the air out. And uh, I've had these for years. This one's a little old. Um, and I love these, actually. This is what I usually use, okay, for stuff that I want to keep dry. Um, because they, they've they always kept my stuff dry. I've never had a problem. They, the outfitters, I don't think, rent these out too often. And I think the reason is they probably need a little more gentle care. Um, and once you tell somebody it's waterproof, if it's not, then they kind of get upset if they get a leak. Um, but this is what I use, okay? Um, when I set it up for canoeing, um, one of the things... Uh, that I think when you're putting your packs in here, and, and by the way, another thing you could use, you could just use your backpack that you take backpacking, right? Or a big or small pack. One thing to note on those, um, say it's um, uh, Deuter or whoever, Osprey, a backpacking pack that you're gonna take, say mountain backpacking, much narrower and much taller than a traditional boundary waters pack. And that's fine, other than a lot of times those things will be too tall to fit in like this. They have to fit this way, and because there's thwarts across a typical canoe, they don't always fit in so well. So you kind of have to wedge it in. Something to think about there if you're going to bring that kind of pack. Um, but, you know, if you want to save some money, why, why buy a new pack or why what, rent one if you have something? But um, something to keep in mind that those ones don't always fit quite as well. The other thing with sort of your classic backpacking pack is they usually will extend above your neck and sometimes even above your head. Uh, and when you've got your canoe on, you've got your thwart with your pads, that could be a problem. Like there can be an obstruction uh, so that you can't properly put that on. So um, one thing I tell folks is when you get your packs ready in your canoe, you know, check it all out at home. Make sure it's all going to work properly across the portage. All right. So that's your packs. And now we're going to think, well, like, what's going to go in that pack? And then how is it going to go in your canoe? Um, in terms of uh, what you're going to put in it, I always say, 
you want to be thinking more like backpacking than car camping. All right. And the idea there is you're going to carry your stuff across the portage and ideally you can carry it across in one trip. So single portaging, but if you have to double portage, that's actually a triple portage. Like if you have to go forward and back and then forward again, you'll have to go over that portage three times, which, you know, most people don't really want to do that. Um, the scenery is not as good on a portage as out on the lakes. And you're going to see generally more mosquitoes or biting flies on that portage when, than being out on the lake. So with that in mind, you know, you want to keep your gear to a confined amount. Uh, the stuff that looks great on your dining room table, you know, for the two weeks or two days, whatever it is that you're packing, doesn't look as great and doesn't look as essential when you're, you know, going back and forth on a portage. So keep it light. Uh, one tip would be like, you can load your canoe or you can load your car in one trip. If it takes you, you know, five trips from your house to your car to load everything in, then you maybe have too much gear, you know, but if you put all your stuff in your packs and you can haul it out in one trip, then maybe you have the right amount of gear. Uh, another point on that is what I always have usually is I'll have per person, two packs, and then uh, one pack might have the food in it. And actually uh, that was another pack, uh, another sort of pack I didn't even show you yet, but this is a food barrel, which is a type of pack. So these, these barrels are originally, I think for shipping uh, chain, and then they get repurposed. You can buy the barrel, um, say from many Boundary Waters type outlets and online stores. Then you can buy a strap that go on it. This is by Granite Gear, very nice. And then I don't have a lid here, but you clamp a lid on this thing and it's gonna like prevent black bears from getting into your food, uh, as well as things like chipmunks and keeps everything dry. So these are great. And something like this, if you're gonna go, and you can rent these, if you're gonna go, um, if you're gonna go to a place that had a major recent fire, like the Pagani Creek fire we talked about before that was a few years ago and burned a lot of the central south boundary waters, um, or a place where there's less trees from the 2000 uh, or the 1999 blowdown, uh, something like this can be pretty important because you don't have a tree to hang your food in otherwise. Um, so those are options and those areas with the, with the, with the regenerating forest like Pagami Creek fire, that's great areas to go. I mean, that's actually very interesting, but a food barrel would be useful in those situations. And there are smaller things you can get like backpacking size and you can get like some sacks as well to put your stuff in. But that is what you'd want. But I will have, as I was saying, two packs along, okay? A big pack and a small pack generally. And then um, the small pack is carried by the guy, person, man or woman, per person, who is going to be carrying the canoe ideally. And then the bigger pack would be carried by the other person. And then the other, only other things I like to carry across on that portage separately, first of all, would be the canoe paddles, right? You're gonna carry these across separately. You can tie them in, but that's usually a hassle. The person who's got the pack on carries the canoe paddle, both person's paddles. And then if you're not wearing your life jackets, which you might not because if you've got a pack on, sometimes they're not this comfortable. Somebody's carrying the life jackets and then possibly fishing gear if it's not tied in. There's something called a bungee dealy bob and there's other things that will hold your canoe, your, your fishing pole in if you want. And then you'll also, your water bottles, you're no doubt gonna be drinking while paddling. And so with water bottles, you can sort of just strap them using the straps or carabiners to your thwarts. The problem with that is they're gonna like, as you go back and forth, they start to swing. And that swinging, if there's water in them, can be, you know, can be loud and it's disruptive and uh, interferes with your balance some too. So I usually don't strap them to the canoe, but I do strap them to the, to the pack. Um, all these packs I showed you have loops of some sort that you can take a carabiner and you can clip your water bottle onto that. And then, you know, usually I have my maps in a map case that will be looped onto the thwart and those aren't so heavy. So if those just wiggle back and forth, that's not such a big deal. Um, now in terms of having your packs in here, we're going to talk about the specific gear, but a few things to keep in mind in terms of balancing the canoe. <clears throat> you generally want your canoe to be flat through the water. That's going to be most efficient. Okay. Notably, <clears throat> when you have gear in the canoe, it's more stable than an empty canoe because you've got a lower center of gravity and you have less of a dynamic load. So you don't have like a person is going to move around and make this canoe unstable with every you know, canoe stroke or anything else they're doing. 
but um but that load like your packs if they're in the bottom of the canoe they're going to lower your center of gravity uh and they're going to you know keep it more stable um generally as i said so so the point there would be if you're just out fishing at night or just on a sightseeing without any gear that canoe is less stable some people think well it's more stable no, that is less stable than a canoe with a lot of gear in it okay now the other thing um is you normally want to be flat okay but if you have a headwind say coming from this way uh coming in you actually want the somebody some people think well you kind of want the front higher to cut through the waves that's actually not what you generally would want you want it to be flat or a little bit lower and the reason for that is that wind if the front is higher than the back the wind is going to catch that front and it's going to start to spin you around and the more it spins you the more it's going to catch it and you get turned around or you're in the back you're just fighting the wind the whole way but if you're slightly lower then the back of the canoe will be slightly higher and then it's kind of working like a weather vane now and you're you're generally if you've got small breezes not a big deal if you've got big waves that you need to go through ideally remember you got your life jacket on but ideally if you can wait those out that's great but if you can't wait them out and you have to go across it for some reason you're going to be far more stable going right into those waves the least stable the canoe is going to be when it's sideways to those waves right if the waves are coming to the side you don't have much stability that's when you know you've got your canoe and you start to tip a little bit a wave breaks over and that's where you're going to potentially flip over canoes are very very stable uh i've actually never had a flip like that in the boundary waters but it happens that's why you have your life jacket on um but if you you know if you have that front a little bit lower into the headwind it's going to help you with steering the same thing is true true with a tailwind if the waves are following behind you uh you want the back to be just a little bit lower um so that again it's going to help you with the breeze another thing on putting your gear in here and th this i see you know this is something you do see a lot and kind of everybody does it by one time in your life like it's night no one else wants to go out but one person does and so you take a canoe out by yourself the tendency would be well hey i'll just sit here uh excuse me i'll sit here in the stern and i'll paddle but if you've got all the weight back here and very little up here you're going to go up like that by a lot especially if it's a kevlar canoe and that is the least stable and like the wind issues i was talking about this is going to blow all around you're going to get carried around a lot so some things to do in that case the simplest one would be instead of sitting in the back you sit in the front you'll notice that here's the back of the canoe here's the front of the canoe there's the bow and the stern you'll notice that the stern the seat is further back than the front is to the the, the the bow the the front seat is to the front so the bottom line is this is closer to the center and so if you sit on this but have your legs sticking out over the into the center of the canoe so you're basically canoeing backwards from the front that is going to be more significantly more stable uh than sitting in the back if you're the only person in there the other thing you can do uh is you can just you know put something down here if you kneel from the center of the canoe that's that's a very good way to do it as well or you can put some sort of weight in the front like or even if you're in the front and you're swept around it put a weight here so that instead of being like this you got like that and an obvious weight would be some of your gear or you know at camp like just grabbing one of the rocks that's just sitting there at shore put it in there and then you go back put that rock back but that will stabilize it um and prevent you from you know uh hopefully flipping over and again always be wearing your life jacket okay so i talked about where your gear is what your gear is in and i talked about the canoe itself um uh i i think i said too like when you get out of that canoe hopefully all the gear is being carried by the two people in the canoe if there's three people in the canoe then you know you've got to divide it up but you want to get across ideally in one, in one trip okay now i'm going to go over some additional gear things uh mostly these are things that are unique to the boundary waters uh and so i you know i don't have time to go over all the kinds of tents and stuff like that the big thing that people are always trying to figure out hey what am i going to do for footwear all right first thing i would say uh when you're in the boundary waters you're not pulling up to a dock or anything like that so you know it's going to be rocky sometimes sandy shoreline very uneven uh most people are going to wet boot it especially if they have a kevlar canoe you can't drive those things up on the rocks so you're going to be standing in the water when you get to the landing um with that in mind your feet are going to get wet and so what a lot of people bring and i've done it many times is they'll bring something like this i say a keen right sort of a water shoe or a simple water shoe too uh these are okay 
Uh, what I like about this is it's gonna give you some toe protection and a little protection on the side, okay? And so like you're, you're less likely to bang against a rock and get injured. Um, but here's the thing, you, and this is gonna drain real nicely, but you'll get gravel down in the bottom and it's very difficult, you know, you can kind of shake it out, but it's not that easy. So, you know, these are okay, but you're gonna gravel in here and you do have some potential points to get like a stick or a rock cut on the side of your foot um, or on your heel. And so uh, a keen or something like it's okay, um, and it gets good support, but I prefer other footwear. And so what I usually bring in, and I, I mentioned too, like you could use like a water, sort of a water sock type thing, people do that, but most people want more foot protection because it's, it's can be rough uh, and you're hauling weight. So a couple other options that I have used over time, something like this, it looks like a tennis shoe. You could just use a tennis shoe actually, it's an old one, but this thing is more of a water shoe that gives good grip, but unlike the Keen, is gonna have protection all around it. And this one, it's maybe hard to see, but there's a mesh, this one has mesh on it. Um, and so like the water drains out, I'll wear socks when I have this on so I don't have abrasion. Um, but something like this is great. If you wanna save money, just use your old shoe, but this works good. If you're somebody who uh, needs more ankle support than this, um, another design, I think these are still available. Uh, I think it's Choda. Uh, these, um, these boots looks more like a classic hiking boot, but it too has like drainage holes in the bottom, if you can see those. And then there's more of a mesh. It's not quite as open as the mesh on that other water shoe, but there's mesh in ways that the water will drain out, okay? So this is a lot like a hiking boot in the sense that it gives you support. It's got nice quick on and off, um, but it's gonna drain, okay? So either one of these two would be my go-to boots most of the year. Uh, and uh, I wouldn't, although I said you can use a tennis shoe, I probably would not wear a, um, a hiking boot because the hiking boot's just not going to drain water out. Like your old hiking boot, not probably as good. Uh, and then I will bring along an extra pair of shoes that I can like say really lightweight tennis shoes or even just a super lightweight, like inexpensive, like foam sandal that I can wear at camp because I don't want to wear my wet boots all the time. Okay. so. That's kind of one of the essential things like footwear. Another essential thing is you gotta provide water. Boundary water is a lot of water, but you should treat or prevent, uh, treat that water one way or the other to prevent getting giardia, maybe cryptosporidium. I know people who don't treat their water. I always treat my water. You don't wanna have a gastrointestinal disease when you're up in the boundary waters or when you get home. So um, when it comes to water, and matches and fire. We'll talk about these two things next. And then we'll talk about some other stuff that's in my pack. And I know we're at like half an hour, but I'm gonna go through some things that I think people will appreciate seeing. When it comes to water and fire, I always have three ways to do it. Three totally independent ways, because things can go down, they can break. And so for water, uh, a really kind of nice go-to system today uh, is these bag designs. So this is a two bag design with a filter in the middle. Okay, and you fill one bag up with water, say hang it from a tree, and then it fills into the bottom one. Now, this type of design has been around for a while, but in the last two years, they've improved it. This is by Platypus, but there's a bunch of other companies, and these are hollow membranes in here, hollow fibers, same thing that's used in like dialysis and stuff today. And these things don't plug permanently, at least. They get plugged a little bit, and then like say like you do 10 bags of dirty water, maybe after 10, it stops flowing. Well, then like you take a half a bag of your clean water, backflow it, this thing will clean out, and then you, could, then you just dump out that dirty water and keep filtering. And these things will last for years, uh, maybe a thousand gallons, where there's other designs that don't have these hollow fibers. Um, they might only last like 40 gallons, 20 gallons, and you can be really frustrated. They, they're great right out, of the, right out of the package, but not so good after using it for a trip or two. Um, one really important thing to do though, to note on these, they do not survive freezing, okay, most of them. And so if you took it out in early spring or late fall and it froze, it's not gonna work. And you might not know it doesn't work. You can test it some ways, but you could have a defective filter and you wouldn't even know it's defective. So if you're out early or late, you probably wanna use a different kind of filter or like this thing, if you kept this underwater, see it's gonna cool off at night, keep it in a pan of water. Um, that pan, unless it's really cold, isn't going to freeze solid, so this thing's not going to freeze. So these are great. I love these things. This is what I usually bring along. 
Now, a disadvantage of this is you have to hang it or hold it up while it's filtering. It goes pretty fast, but if you're going to be moving a lot and not taking breaks and still need to filter water, then another alternative is a pump type filter. There's a lot of pump filters out there. Um, I've had them, I've not had them all, but I've had a lot. This is one I will bring along. It's heavier than that, but this is an MSR filter and uh, it's the same principle. Um, it, it has those membranes, it back flushes as you go through. This thing should last many years. Um, and it actually can freeze, although I really don't want to have it freeze, but this one can freeze. This is kind of an expensive item. This is actually probably a couple hundred bucks. So this is a good thing to buy when the camping stores have their big 20% sales. You know, you can get this um, for a good, a good sale on that thing. Okay, so even if I have those two along or one of those two, I'm still gonna have water tablets along because I've had those things lose, get lost or break. You know, the fitting breaks, you're out of luck. So this should be my second way if I had one of those along. I wouldn't usually bring both of them. Have iodine tablets. You may never use them, but if you need them, you can. And then the third way to filter water, purify your water would be to bring it up near boiling. Um, and you know, you can do that, but that's gonna take a lot of fuel or fire. And so, you know, in a pinch, you can do that. I've had to do that before because I didn't have two other things along. That's why I have two other things. But that would be um, uh, three ways to do that. So he said, well, what about fire? Because you know, body waters is great because you can build fires and you can collect wood. You can't do that in most places. It certainly can't collect wood in state parks or national parks. Um, and I'll talk about saws in a second, but you're going to build a fire or you're going to light your stove. So, you know, the obvious thing, three things along. I always have matches. These are just simple, inexpensive matches. I'll have these along in plastic, more than one pack in more than one plastic bag, you know, different bags. You can also get the waterproof ones. Those are great. I've had those and they're, they're good. Uh, the other thing I'll have is a lighter. This is and a, more than one generally, but lighters, you know, are good. You can do, there's some pretty nice lighters you can buy. This is just, you know, a Bic. One thing to note on these, though, if they get wet, they generally will not light. Uh, you can't get the spark to go. So um, you want to keep that dry. But like I've had it in shorts, got wet in, in, in the water, and it didn't light. Um, but something that will always give you a spark is one of these little magnesium sparkers, right? So you can, these things are great. I don't want to start a fire here. But these are excellent. And what I like doing with these, and it can be underwater, no problem. I light my stoves with this stuff. I don't typically light a fire, but if you scratch, make little bark, like a birch bark pile, you can light a fire with this too. But I'll light my stove with this. And you know, even if your stove has electronic ignition, something like this is good for backup. Okay. So three ways of getting water, three ways of having a fire. And that's a pretty, pretty valuable, pretty useful. Now, if you're gonna build a fire, what are you gonna bring along to collect your firewood? Remember, you're gonna get dead and down wood, away from the shore, not on beaver lodges. Um, the classic Minnesota one is the Sven saw, if you're gonna cut wood. This one will assemble into a, into a triangle. These are great. These are the, this is a go-to for a lot of people. And I have it and I use it. Um, the disadvantage, because it's a triangle, you get kind of a limited cutting diameter. Again, not to disparage it, um, and I have it and I use it. But an alternative, if you're looking for it, uh, is one of these little folding saws. And there are other options. But these little folding saws are different brands. You can get one called by, by Coglin, which you know is inexpensive, but maybe not the best. But a type to look at with these ones are made by Silky. Silky is a Japanese company that makes incredible saws. Professional arborists use them. Um, but in the last few years, I've started to see these little ones come out. Um, and REI and a lot of other stores are starting to carry these things. And the steel is excellent. It's a pull saw and you can cut through a lot of stuff. One thing to note, I found out kind of the hard way, there's a couple different lines. If you go online and buy it, pay a lot of attention to weight. These two saws look to be about the same. They're both the same company, but like this one is probably twice the weight of this one. And so uh, look at the weight and get the light one. Okay, they also make some longer ones that are great too if you're winter camping. And in fact, I was at a volunteer event for, with the Forest Service and that's the saws they use when they go winter on winter trail maintenance. They use these silky saws, which are a little longer than those. Um, so the silky saws are really nice. They cut amazing, they keep an edge, okay? Um, then you think, okay, so, you know, I don't really cook. I got I know we're close to time, but I'm gonna save time for, for, for some, from, some questions, but I'm gonna show you a few other things. So when I'm out there camping, I don't really cook so much on the fire, because it's uneven. 
and I have two ways of cooking. I usually have them both along. One is I'll bring along a jet boil. And if you haven't seen these, they're great. Like the little canister of fuel stays in there. There's some pieces of clip on here. So you can boil water very fast, pound per pound for fuel that other than like fuel you collected. Like, so like if you're gonna use canisters or white gas, pound per pound, this will bring about water to boil faster than anything. So in the morning, I usually am having oatmeal. I'm moving fast. This stuff, these things will boil up water with, with no problem. Even a little canister like this will last a long time. And you can put bigger canisters in as well. But I like this for boiling water. But you know, you can't really cook on it very easily, like making pancakes or something like that. So then the other stove I bring along uh, is an MSR Dragonfly. Okay, what I like about this thing, very adjustable temperature. Then I bring it separate fuel bottles along. Um, but what's really good about these stoves is everything's fuel maintainable. If you have a problem, you can take it apart and you can, you know, fix it usually just with intuition, or you can get little kits, like $20 kit that has the main like valves and gaskets. I would bring that along. So then you can always fix this. But again, like if you've got three sources of heat and you got matches, you can build a fire. Okay. If you had to, um, a couple of other gear things I'm going to tell you about, and then we can go to some questions. One would be, uh, I don't know if you folks have seen this. This is a, uh, it's Nemo, that was near, but Nemo is a company you're starting to see, they're making tents now. And I think this is one of their first products. But what is in here is your classic tarp, you know, that you can put over your tent site. I think this is nine by nine feet, um, but it's got drop down mosquito netting walls all right and it's not that heavy it's much less it's it's mostly air in here because it's like just the netting um this thing is amazing if the bugs are out okay you can so you could set this up if it rains you're good but then you just drop this that sides down and it's like a screen house um and it's not that heavy if you're gonna bring a luxury in mosquito season this is great and i know at least some outfitters rent these okay Another item, which you might not want to buy, uh, but you can rent or you might buy, uh, is a cot. I'm telling you, don't bring too much weight, but if you have somebody that has back issues or can't really sleep on the ground well, there's cots. Uh, you know, and cots can be heavy and there's a lot of types and not, some of them are not that good. But I'll tell you one that's amazing. Uh, Helinox, okay, these are rentable by at least one outfitter up in the Boundary Waters. And I don't have it set up. But this makes a, this weighs, you know, I have to look, maybe it's three or four pounds. So it's not trivial, but it's not that heavy if somebody can't really sleep on the ground. If someone has a back issue, these are great. So I have this in large part go winter camping. I like to stay off the ground and I can put it in a sled. But in the summer, this can still be good for the right people. And again, this is not so cheap. This is approaching $200, but you can rent them, okay? Then the other luxury item I would bring along sometimes, um, and much more often than that, would be a little chair like this. You've all probably seen them at stores. You might have seen them. So these are pretty light, and they pack down to about this weight. This is actually even a lighter one than that one, but about this weight, and that can be a real luxury too. I mean, the whole point, though, is you don't want too much of that stuff along because then you have too much stuff, and you're going to, like, you know, have to portage more. A couple other suggestions. One of them, and then we can do questions, keys, two sets of keys. You always want two sets of keys because you know, and you want them separate, probably with different people. So like, you don't want to like find out, oh shoot, didn't that key fell out in that portage. You got another set of keys for your cars, car, keys for your car. And the other thing, you know, most people probably bring a cell phone along if for another reason than a camera. Okay, that's our camera these days. And you can get these on different stores. So these are a little waterproof bag. Many cameras today or cell phones are waterproof, but they don't float. And so something like this is good to put your phone in and you can um, still shoot through it. Not so good. You might take it out for important pictures, but buy, they're separately sold, say on uh, various websites, a little floater thing. Okay. So that, you know, when you accidentally put your canoe, your, your picture and it drops over the camera, or the phone drops over the edge, you don't lose it. Okay. So this little combo is good. Um, so that's most of the gear stuff I had. Um, and other than that, you know, you're doing like backpacking tents, stuff like that, bug repellent, things like that. The Friends of the Boundary Waters has a good packing list and they have a little downloadable guide that talks about a lot of things we talked about today and also like the gear you'd want to bring. Um, so, you know, I didn't cover everything, but those were some of the highlights from what I, what I would bring along.
Hey, Dan, thank you so much for that uh, great overview about tips and, and tricks here. We do have a few uh, a number of questions that have come up uh, 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 during, the, during your presentation here. Uh, uh, first, with the the, the bent panel uh, panel that you held up there, uh, is it is it J stroke easier with that? That's a good question. So you know, a J stroke is when you're paddling and you just do a little bit of a twist at the end if you're not familiar with it, right? And so that can help you to steer the canoe, especially the back. Sometimes you need that that dynamics. Um, I don't. I think it might actually be slightly more difficult to be honest, but you can definitely do it. Like I've had this kind of paddle for years and it's, it's not a problem. I mean, I think, I don't, I don't know if it's necessarily easier or harder as much as it's a little bit different would okay. be my, my opinion. Other people might have a different sense on it. Okay. So you wouldn't necessarily uh, put the, the person with the bend paddle paddle in the bow. You, you, I mean, you use it in the stir, but, but. I, I wouldn't, I, but usually uh, everybody in the canoe has bent paddles when I'm out there. Okay. Okay. Great. And um, when you portage, uh, do you, do you try to keep your the uh, the canoe horizontal, or, or do you try to tip it up a little uh, a little bit for for line of sight, or you know what what do you, you uh, like to do? Yeah, I'll have it tipped up a little bit, um, and for better line of sight. And you generally, I generally want so like it's tipped up so the the front where you're visible is higher. That's going to help you. Yeah, you know, but sometimes there's branches, so you might even be doing a little of this, but. Mm -hmm. um, uh, also, if you have a, if it's set a little bit more heavy to the back, just by like a pound or two, that helps you so that when you're carrying it, right, you might have your hands in front, so you're pulling down. That's much easier than trying to lift up for a portage. Like, you use the gravity of your hands, okay? And you might have one hand or two hands and alternate, um, which is why if you start strapping stuff to your canoe, and you start disrupting a comfortable balance, it's not gonna work as good. And you'll have to figure that out. But like I said, you could strap in paddles, maybe. You could trap, strap in your light, your um, uh, your fishing gear. But if you disrupt it so the weight is in the front, it's gonna, it's gonna start balancing downward and that's gonna make it harder. So yeah, I usually have it a little, a little bit further to the back. And you can either do that by moving the pads sometimes, you know, the canoe mm -hmm. on the pad uh, or the pads on your shoulder or, um, or like how you trimmed it with any additional weight. But it definitely helps to be able to see better out the front. Okay, great. And, and you had talked about some of the water uh, purification methods and you provide a, a great overview. What are your thoughts on steri pins? Oh well, yeah, that's a good question. So I, I have a steri pen actually. I have one of the early generation um, and I wasn't using it for many years. And then I started using it again sometimes. Um, especially winter camping when I wasn't using my float, my bag. So mm -hmm. I actually like the Steri pen. Um, if people don't know about it, it's a little pen. There's a couple of models that battery operated, sometimes rechargeable that has a little light wand, a little wand out there that sends out, uh, I guess it's UV radiation that sterilizes your water. Okay. At least, or it kills the, or immobilizes the germs in there. And that's a, you know, it's government approved. Um, I've used it. I actually kind of like those, um, you know, it's probably more prone to failure because it's electronic and there's a glass element than mm -hmm. a typical filter. So if I had that along, I would still have my other two ways. I'd have my tablets and maybe something else, but they're, they're nice, but you know, make sure you have extra batteries or a way to charge it. Okay, good deal. And um, for bug control, do you, uh, have you ever used uh, uh, thermal cell products or anything like that? Or what do you, what do you use for bug control? You know, so, so bug control, you know, behavior is one of the best ways for the bug control, right? So like uh, we have sort of limited time, but like you want to get out early in the morning if you're going to travel. And then, you know, so at night, you know, you've got your tent set up before the mosquitoes, for example, are bad because um, they're most active dawn and dusk. But nevertheless, you're going to get, you know, come across mosquitoes generally in most of the year. So what I usually do, um, I use, uh, and in a lot of ways, doing, I'll use a little bit of, uh, of a deep repellent. Okay, try to put on as little as I can and maybe wear a little more clothes. I do not wear a bug net because it's just a hassle. I've never really liked those. Some people will put, um, I don't know if it's permethrin, there's, a, there's something you can put in your clothes. I, I just not in favor of like soaking my clothes in a, in, in a repellent or a pesticide. And then the thermocell, I know people who like them and use them. Um, I've never used one. It's another thing like, I'm not exactly sure about what's coming into the air and I don't really want to breathe that. 
You know, so my <laughs> preference would be to not, that I don't do that. I, I know people who swear by it and they say it's very safe, but that's just, I, I prefer to limit the amount of the chemical type stuff. Okay, good deal. And uh, when, when you do get caught in, uh, in a thunderstorm or bad weather, what, what um, you know, maybe both uh, on land and uh, on the water, what are some of your suggestions for dealing with a thunderstorm? Yeah, so, you know, anytime there's thunder, you do not want to be in the water. And so if you can avoid it, like the bugs, like you want to avoid it. If there is thunder, you want to get off the water uh, or lightning as soon as you can. And if there's no campsite, just go to the shore, okay? And, uh, you know, from a lightning standpoint, you do not want to be near the tallest thing on the water. Or, you know, like you don't want to be under a tall tree. And also, uh, I'm not the expert on this, but you should also, if there's more people in your group, you should be spread out. Okay, so that if one, if those if lightning hits one location, you're spread out enough that not everybody's going to get hit. Okay, and then in terms of, you know, uh, uh, high winds, which you might have as well, you're going to want to like when you set up your tent, look around, make sure you're not under a tree that looks to be a high possibility of, you know, falling if there was to be a storm. Um, you know, no loose branches, you know, smaller trees better than a big tree. If a tree's leaning, don't be you know, camping here, camp over here. But yeah, you got, you want to get off the water. Um, certainly, thunder is, is threatening. Uh, good, uh, good deal. Um, do you have a, a preference for, for maps? Uh, you know, so there's three of them out there, and I think they're all good. So uh, the Voyager maps, Fisher maps, and McKenzie are all, are all good. Uh, I actually am involved with making the Voyager maps, so I'm probably uh, slanted towards them. Um, but they're all good. There's actually a fourth map. Uh, National Geographic makes two trails illustrated, I think it's called maps for the boundary waters. Those are not really useful for navigation. Like they're interesting, um, but like I wouldn't use that for navigation. Okay. And, uh, and the, the, for the footwear that you, you, you showed those, um, the boots with the, where you can uh, drain water out. But what do you do like maybe late in the season when the water's cold? Do you like have uh, actual boots? What do you, what do, you do uh, in yeah. that, you know, the late fall paddle? Yeah, so that's a good question. I have two boots that I've worn consistently in that condition. I don't have them here set now, but I will often bring along what I'd call a mud boot or a farming boot, you know, just that's a, a molded like green plastic boot mm -hmm. by like Fleet Farm um, for 25, 35 bucks. So I actually use those in the early season, late season. So they'll be tall, right? They'll be, you know, um, they'll be, you know, up to your knee sometimes or close to it. And those are good. Um, and then you're going to be a little more careful getting in and out of the water because you mm -hmm. don't want to go over the top of that boot. But those are good. Those are, those are great for that. If the water does go over the top, you're going to be wet. Okay. Mm -hmm. um, but those boots, you can just dry them out and put on some new socks. Uh, I also have some, um, I guess, LL Bean tall ones, like the leather ones that looks, you know, most sort of classic. Uh, those work too, and I bring those along. They're not quite as waterproof. Um, and I will note, there are some waterproof sock type constructions people use um, that I have had some of those years ago, and I know people swear by them. I don't, use, I have not used those. It's one of those things, things change, and there's mm -hmm. new, new gear coming all the time. But I do know some people love to use some of these sort of neoprene and just other type boots and stuff. I, I definitely don't have all the answers on footwear, but you know, those are some of the things I've done. Great. And you know, we have a, uh, a, a question out here that um, going to our website might be, might be useful here. So I'm going to see if I can, uh, um, I don't know if uh, my website, see if I uh, can, can get to that. I've had a, a a few things up here. Uh, let's see if I can kind of get to the the friend site here. And uh, so some people had a question about uh, about how to get uh, a permit. And you can actually get to the permit from our website. So if you go to uh, 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 friends-bwca.org and our Explorer tab, go down to the uh, BWCA permits and you will get to the, you will be able to go to the, they will send you to the, uh, uh, at the bottom here at the recreation.gov site and you'll be able to get your permit right there. So that is how, uh, uh, you, one way you can get your permits is at the recreation.gov site, but it's right at our, at our website. Uh, one of the things that Dan referenced to was a, a guidebook to, um, to the Boundary Waters that uh, Pete Marshall 
on our team here put together. And you can get to that book also from that explore.tabs here. So this has some of the information, you know, it's, it's got a hard copy of it. You can uh, write to us, we can give you a hard copy, but it's also available right on our website here. And so uh, a number of the items covered by, uh, uh, by Dan this afternoon uh, have been covered by Pete, Pete Marshall here in our book. And it's an ebook that you can easily uh, flip through um, on, on uh, your, your computer uh, on, on, uh, at, from our website on, uh, from your computer there. So those are just a, a couple things uh, 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 for, for you here. Um, so, um, it, and uh, uh, we, are, we are excited to keep this, the series of, uh, of webinars going here. And we have one in a week from today. It is by uh, Ben Olson. He's a, a, a well-known wildlife photographer. And he will be giving a presentation next Wednesday, June 17th at 12 noon on wildlife and nature photography in the boundary, boundary water. So, so Ben will talk a, a little bit about technique, the sort of f-stop and, and, um, uh, and ISO and other things that make a great a great photograph he'll also talk a little bit about equipment the sort of uh, Nikon Canon and, and, and other sort of debates there and telephoto lenses but he will also be talking about location as well and, and just like uh, 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 anglers like Dan Pauly and Rob Christ I know sometimes photographers don't like to give away their uh, their secret spots but but uh, uh, Ben might be might share a spot where you can see moose like this and, and take up and, and, and take a, a photograph. So um, I want to, again, uh, thank Dan for this, uh, this, this, this uh, great presentation. Uh, have fun on, on your, your trip that begins tomorrow as you're heading up there. Have, yep. have a lot of fun. And uh, I want to thank all of you that are, are, are part of this, uh, um, that attended this, this uh, um, live video presentation here. Uh, you are, again, the strength of the organization here. We will make this uh, presentation available. We will send you a link to the recording of it, and we'll have a link to the recording of it on our website. So please go back and, and watch it again if you, if you want to uh, uh, make sure you got those key points that Dan brought up. And, and share the link with your with your with your with your your family and friends. So uh, from all of you, from all of us here at Friends of the Boundary Waters Wilderness, uh, thank you so much for being with us this afternoon. And we look forward to seeing you uh, next Wednesday, June seventeenth, for wildlife and nature photography in the Boundary Waters. Have a great afternoon. Thank you. Thank you. Bye.